Boy, oh boy, am I excited. I just came out in the shop and guess what I got? That's right. Let's talk about any rollbacks. Now get ready. Here we go. <laughs> has given me a lot to think about. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Ryan Ride Mechanic channel. How the heck are you doing today? On today's video, I want to talk about any rollbacks. Okay, so let's get into it. When a roller coaster train goes up the lift hill, it's being carried by a chain dog. Well, what happens if the chain dog breaks? Well, this actually happened to me uh, when I was working at the park. We had a train go up the lift, it tried to catch, and then the chain dog catastrophically snapped in half, causing the train to roll backwards down into the brakes. Now this was a boomerang, so it was designed to roll backwards, but most rides aren't designed to roll backwards down the lift. So what else would happen? Let's see. What happens if you got on the lift hill and the chain snapped? Well, we've seen videos of things like that where the chain snapped and the vehicle started to roll backwards, but they put things on there to prevent that. These are called anti-rollbacks and they're typically the teeth that go up the lift hill. In this video, you're gonna hear me refer to these a lot instead of saying the full anti-rollbacks each time. I'm simply just gonna to refer to them as ARBs, standing for anti-rollbacks. So let's talk about the types of anti-rollbacks. The most common type of anti-rollback is simply a dog or a ratchet, depending on the manufacturer. Uh, these things are mechanical in nature and they're typically a big solid piece of steel something that looks kind of like this. This is just a cheap knockoff of a B&M anti-rollback. Essentially, this is the, the entire dog or safety ratchet, as B&M calls it. And then this little piece down here at the bottom is simply a piece of urethane or rubber at the bottom that helps silence it as it's running up the lift hill. Gerschlauer, infinity coasters, things like that. Uh, bigger B&M dive coasters, they like to use two to four safety ratchets per coach to keep the train evenly weighted when it stops on both sides. The majority of B&M trains use four anti-rollbacks and they're pretty much evenly spaced. They start about coach two and run back and the last one is on coach, depending on the length of the train, the last one's on coach seven or eight. And they're evenly spaced about every other coach in between that. This comment's kind of out of place for this video right in this spot here, but vertical lift hills, uh, like silent vertical lift hills that you find on a lot of the Gerschlauer Infinity coasters, they use brake fins or eddy current fins going up the lift hill, and that's in conjunction with the brake on the motor itself. So when they stop, the brake on the chain becomes the anti-rollback. Uh, but a lot of them are simply just designed to open the brake and let the train roll backwards down to make for a quick evacuation on a vertical lift. So we'll talk about the dog's receiver now. Going up the lift hill, this is the big toothed rail you see going up there. That's a lot of what manufacturers, a lot of them call that simply toothed rail or safety rat rail or ratchet rail, something along those lines going up the lift hill. Um, been tearing up some cardboard for this. Uh, so as you can see, a section of this pretty much looks like this. That's pretty much what it is. And the way this is, is that your dog or ratchet will come up here and pretty much drag along this guy, then drop into place, and then back over here, drop into place again, then back over here. So every time you hear this dog clunk down into place like that, this is the click that you're hearing as the train goes up the lift hill. So all the clicking that goes up there, it's typically your ratchet simply just jumping over this cam each time going click, click, click as it passes up the lift hill. Now, there are silent cams out there and we'll go into those a little bit later but it's the same principle except for it holds the cam just above these teeth as it passes by. And then once the momentum of the train runs out, the cam is allowed to simply fall back into place. 
The lift hills themselves are also equipped with anti roll back devices, a lot of times in two forms. The first one is a brake on the motor itself, so that when the motor stops driving the lift chain, the brake applies and it simply holds the entire lift assembly where it is. The second one, uh, I've seen a lot just mainly on B&Ms, but they do it quite religiously there, is they put a sprag on the gearbox. A sprag is a giant, looks like a bearing off to the side, and that follows the lift chain as it's going. So when the motor stops, B&M typically, typically doesn't use motors with a brake on them, so they don't have that brake option. But what they do in its place is they use the sprag. And the sprag is what, when that train tries to roll backwards on there, the sprag stops the motion and only allows motion one way. So if you're looking at the side of it, just imagine it's turning counterclockwise. And then when the lift stops, it tries to turn clockwise, but the sprag won't let it. So there is a daily check that has to be done on a lot of the B&Ms where you have to check and make sure that sprag is working properly. That's a fun little check to do. Um, it's kind of a test of skill if you know how to do it. If not, you need a lot of people and a lot of time on the lift hill uh, to slowly bump the train up there. So let me show you what that's about. So we'll go back to our rail and ratchet here. Normally, on a lot of times when you stop the lift, the train rolls back just a little bit, but enough for wherever the ratchet is to simply just go into place like that. So with that, B&M says, well, we need to test and make sure that the, the safety sprag is working on the lift hill. So how do you test that? Well, they want you to stop the train on the lift hill to where in a lot of cases your four anti-rollback dogs are not engaged in any of the teeth of the tooth rail. So they want you to stop it like this, essentially, where there's a gap there. Now, that gap is hard to come by. So a lot of times when we first started doing that, we had to get, we had to put the train on the lift hill. We had to set the ride into manual mode. Someone had to go back to the panel and watch it while we went up there. And then we had to manually bump the lift hill inch by inch until it got to that spot where we verified none of the dogs were catching. And then we had to go over there and we had to look, say, yep, it's not rolling backwards. So that is the test. Basically, if you, if you rolled it forward and stopped it there and then suddenly hit, you know, hit the lift stop and then it slightly just rolled backwards, that means your sprag has failed downstairs. Uh, I've had failed sprags before. They do not just gently let the train roll backwards like that. Uh, when you hit stop and the sprag has failed, it makes a very loud metal on metal grinding, banging, you can hear it across the park sound as that assembly slips under 14 tons of tension sitting on top of it. So it's, re it's really not a good sound, but that's what happens. So the ride I was working, I learned by doing this a handful of times, a couple of us learned it, that if you stood at the control panel and you centered yourself dead center with the operator buttons and everything and looked straight across at the lift and you used some visual points of reference across the park and you used some trees and some pillars and stuff, as the front row, the handlebar of the front row was passing those pillars in a certain spot, if you hit lift stop pretty much every single time you could stop the train right there and there's nothing, nothing holding at that point. It was a clear indicator if you got that wrong though, because the way ours was set up, if you got that wrong just by a little bit and one of these one of these cams actually bit in, as soon as it went backwards and hit and did that, it wasn't silent either. It would typically went Poo! and you could hear it. It's pretty loud. It like resonates through the lift. So we knew when we got it, but we did that a bunch of times and each time we went out and verified that, yep, all four weren't latched in and they were all free and the sprag was in fact holding the chain. So this is your basic and this is also pretty much the exact same thing that's used on most aero rides, Vacoma rides, things like that. They might be shaped slightly differently, 
but this is the same exact concept no matter what. Lift it up, let it fall back in place. Lift it up, let it fall back in place. And you're just doing this time and time again. Uh, B&M also had a service bulletin come out where they wanted to check and make sure that these guys, safety ratchets, were moving freely. Because what you're supposed to do every day is this guy's sitting underneath the train like that, and you have to basically, there's a stop right about here, but it's actually hits this top piece right there. You lift it up till it stops, and then you simply just let it go, and it should fall back down. So every day you check that, you go clunk, 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 and it's like, yep, that's good. Um, but when you greased it, remember grease, right? When you greased it, sometimes you would push that guy up, and it would just very slowly come back down. And it's like, hmm, well, if it's slow moving, then you can't guarantee it's safe at that point in time because that means if you stop, this thing was sitting there trying to do this, but when you stop the train, it's slowly coming back down and it might just catch the edge and then it might be able to go backwards on top of that. The manufacturer didn't want that. So what they did on a lot of rides, you could see them um, they're very hard to catch. I wanted to get video of this, uh, but not being near a park to take it, it's, it was pretty difficult. Um, they're very hard to catch, but typically around the transfer area, somewhere around the station in that general area, uh, B&M actually gave us ours and they said, they gave us instructions on how to mount it and where to mount it and all the measurements of where it was exactly supposed to be and how it was supposed to tie into the control system. So I'm imagining every park that got this retrofit or this check was uh, got the same type of information according to their ride where they needed to put it. So it's not like a every B&M here it is, but a lot of them, it's right as it leaves a transfer. And it's pretty cool. What it is is just a big lobe. It's a UHMW, which is ultra high molecular weight plastic. So it's a big lobe that just sits there on the track. And there's two sets of proximity sensors. There's actually, I believe, three, if I remember properly. Um, there's one on the front side of the lobe, direction of travel. So as it comes up to the lobe, there's one. And then on the back side of the lobe, but not directly on the back side, there is another one that's a little bit further out. And then on the right-hand side, or on the left-hand side of that, there was another proximity sensor setting there. And then what would happen is as you would advance the train from transfer, maybe it was a service break into the station, what would happen is that proximity sensor hanging on the left-hand side would count the chain dogs passing by. So for a lot of B&Ms, it's two. So as it passed by, it would count one, two. And then the ride would know that the chain dog, kind of like your cam, wasn't stuck up. So the chain dog, it was down, and, and as it passed by, the sensor went click, yep, that's one. And then as the next one came by, it went click, yep, there's two. It did the same thing for the anti-rollbacks, but it actually checked the function of the anti-rollback safety ratchet in this case. So what would happen is as it comes up, as the train's coming this way, the first sensor before the lobe would simply detect that the anti-rollback ratchet was there. And it would say, yep, and it would count one, two, three, four as they pass by. As it hit the curve, the lobe, it would hit the lobe and then lift the anti roll back up. And then as the train passed by, it would let it drop back down. Now, as the lobe ended, right at the end of the lobe, but just about this far away, about eight, 10 inches away, was another proximity sensor. So what that did is that allowed that if my lobe was like this and the ratchet came up and it was too slow, it was stuck up there, like I greased it too much that day, it would go over this and it would just continue right over that proximity sensor and it wouldn't fall down. It eventually fall down, but it wouldn't fall down. So it would fault the ride. As soon as the combs came up, a lot of cases there's uh, combs on a floorless coaster. If you're inverted, it would just be when it comes to the home position and stops in there, same with a stand-up, um, they would fault and it would say that there was a safety ratchet or any rollback ratchet mismatch count. So 
is the ride was supposed to count incoming to that lobe for outgoing for. So a lot of times what would happen is it would count four coming in and then three on the back side. So you knew that one of your ratchets wasn't working properly. Now we first have like, doesn't it give us a, a, a logic error and say like, well, we know it was ratchet number two or ratchet number four, but I've had it only one time since they installed it. And it was really obvious when we pulled the train off. So it was a safety issue. So it was like, okay, as soon as the thing happened, we unloaded that train. We had to send it around again because the train in the back was loaded with people also as well. And then we had to pause operation of the ride. And when that train came back into transfer, we went ahead and switched the transfer mode on, moved the train over, put it away in the work bay. Then we went out there to check it. And it was pretty easy. It's like, well, this one's kind of sluggish. Yeah. Well, this one's kind of sluggish. And then you came up to the one and you were just like, okay, that's a problem. <laughs> <laughs> There's not really much you can do with that. Um, the, the the best way to fix a sluggish anti roll back is you take it apart. You have to take the train apart right there and remove the cam itself. Because the one time we had that happen, it was a newer person working on the ride. And the B&Ms are very particular. They use some really, really heavy duty grease for big pivot components and they use some lighter weight stuff for things that have to move freely and then some really light stuff for the same type of devices but in the restraints. So what had happened is that a mechanic at the time put the heavy weight grease inside of the safety ratchet and it caused it to become very slow. Well we tried for a little bit we tried well like well can we flush the grease out with something but the tolerances were too tight it just wasn't pushing through we were making it worse. So we had to remove the safety ratchet, which is a pain in the butt. Um, have to take off brake plates on both sides, which typically means you need a torch to take off the brake plates. And then uh, remove the pin that the ratchet sits on, pull it out of there to take the safety ratchet out on a B&M coaster. Definitely nowhere near as bad as if you're working on a dive machine or something like that. I've seen the underside of those. Ooh, that must be... That must be nasty to pull one of those things apart. So those are the majority of ratchets that are used around 99% of roller coasters, you know. Uh, they are, there's nothing really driving these things. They just sit there. In this case, like this is, like I said, it's a mock B&M. So in this case, there is a plate on the inside of the coach that sits it and holds it down in this position. And it's allowed to go back and forth between that. Um, and then as you see his shape, all this weight is simply just hanging over that, holding it down. Um, this is one of the reasons why when you hear some trains go through like zero G elements, you'll hear a clicking or a tacking as it goes through there. And that's what it is. It's chain dogs and any rollbacks through there, coming up a little bit and then clunk back down. But because it's done over that element, you hear them clack, 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 clack as it goes through there. Uh, when I first started working on the Flores roller coaster, I was sitting there listening to go through that zero G roll. And I was hearing it go clack, 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 clack as it went through that roll. And I was like, what is that sound? What is that? I remember I was brand new. So I was literally sitting there looking at the track itself. I'm like, is it something in the track? Is the train hitting something there? How come it doesn't make it anywhere else? And then, so basically I found out in that zero G element, the train inverted. And then because it was a zero G element, there wasn't hardly any gravity in it. These guys would just fall down, clunk. And then as it would come back around the other way, clunk again. So it was allowed to do that. And there was four of them. So it was eventually eight of those ticks as it passed over there. Uh, you don't hear them anywhere else because all the other loops and things like that, they have plenty of force in them, create G-force, which simply just holds these guys down. On standard, like sit down type roller coasters, just regular roller coasters, these guys aren't 
There's nothing pushing them down. There's no springs. There's no nothing else. Inverts, yes, they have springs in them because this cam is upside down like this. And then what you have to do is you have to take a spring and pull this back like that to push this guy up. And then some manufacturers simply just use, it's shaped differently, of course. And then uh, some manufacturers will just use the shape and basically it just uses a counterweight to hold this up in the air. And they also use a spring, but it's mainly just a weight can delivered off the other side. The next one I want to talk about is pretty much the only other one out there. There's not many styles when it comes to any rollbacks. You have physical ratchets engaging on a tooth rail. That's the majority of stuff out there. Or some manufacturers like to use cams. Now, you guys are going to be surprised to learn that I made this out of cardboard. I know, right? It's crazy. Never done something like that before. But anyway, so this is kind of a mock of a cam that you would find on a roller coaster. Now, where can you find cams like this? Well, you can find them in two places. You could find them on the top of an SLC. I know I was, used to work on the SLCs. Um, so you can find them up there, and you could also find them in the track of some rides as well. So the first one that comes to mind is Space Mountain at Disneyland. There's cams on the track there used in place of a standard any rollback rail. Really smart on Disney's part because they use those and they're, they're silent. They don't make any noise. So it's a pretty safe option. The only problem is... So you got to put these things every couple of feet all the way up the lift hill. That's a lot of stuff to inspect every day. Now, I'm used to this type of style where you have two cams like this. So you can see them there. And what they have is they have little teeth. And the reason why I colored the ends of them like that is because these teeth are typically removable inserts that come out of there. and you can put new ones in there. That way when they wear down, you can just replace them with new stuff. There's a measurement that Vacoma gave and says they can't be worn below, it was like two millimeters. We replaced them every year, but we took one one time and ground it down to two millimeters. Holy crap, there was nothing left. And that's pretty amazing. Vacoma says that works with that much material missing because it was like, whew, man, there was nothing left on those things. So the way these work is they sit here like this and then they either the brake fin or the fin on the track comes through and then causes these guys to open as it passes through in the center. And then what happens is that as the train stops and tries to move backwards, these guys then bite back into the rail and cause it to stop. I guess if you're looking at it this way, it'd probably make more sense to probably make more sense to do it like this. So they'd be passing by like that as the drive sword's coming down this way. And then as it tries to stop and the train rolls backwards, it essentially goes and stops. So those are any rollback cams used on the top of SLCs and in the tracks of things like Space Mountain. So I built up also a mock board. This one I went way above and beyond, because I not only use cardboard, but I use parts of soda cans too. Coming up in the world, absolutely. Everyone else is like 3D rendering and CAD programs and stuff, and I am like, I used aluminum cans this time. Oh yeah, that's right. Still scotch tape down. That's what I do. A little easier like this. Sorry if it looks funky. I still have to do this and get the microphone because I put this in front of my face. It's hard to hear what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we're gonna take this first one, put it on just like that. Take the second one, same thing. Put it on just like that. And now there's the opening in the center. So as the brake fin, so this, this works like on the SLC, there is a fin 
that sits right next to the chain. Uh, you don't really notice it because it's only 12 millimeters wide. Uh, and you really you have to look for it, otherwise you it just blends in with everything. You don't really see that it's there. But as that fin comes up here, it hits this and it opens these two guys up like that as it passes through. And then they're also spring loaded back down. So that would be the engaged right there. So if we spring load these real quick, hold on. I know what you're saying, and yes, I'm working on spring-loading cardboard. It's only for YouTube I do the high-dollar stuff like this. Oh, as a safety reminder, really, for your roller coaster and your amusement park, don't use cardboard parts for any rollbacks. It doesn't work good. I don't recommend it at all. So if you're working on a real roller coaster, please don't use cardboard because if I get pulled into court and you guys are like your honor the guy on YouTube told me to use cardboard to make any rollbacks so I did hey check that out spring loaded now all right so here is my fin we'll call this right here so my fin will come up right through here and I'll push it straight up between these two cams. And then as I try to pull backwards, I can't. It stopped. It's actually... Hey, check it out. I just made a cardboard any rollback. <laughs> and it's working. Surprising, right? But you can see that from there. So as I push that fin up and try to pull it back down, it stops because those cams are just minutely letting the fin pass through and then it stops again. Now, this is the reason why on the SLCs, when you hear them going up the lift hill, if you pay attention, it sounds like there's metal dragging because it is. As you're going by, as, as this fin's going by, it's dragging through those cams. And then every day it's important that we have to get up there in the train and then we have to check and make sure the cams are free moving, you know, that you can open them both up like that and they spring back on their own and they meet back somewhere in the center. The cams find their own center because even if I left them like this and then I, I sent the ride out the first time, the brake fin will come back in or the the anti-rollback fin will come back in and it will naturally just find its center again as soon as it opens the first time and then it stops. Okay, so that is the basic cam design that you find on top of SLCs and in the track. Now in the track, Disneyland uses these guys so this is mounted in the train of the SLC. In fact, if you're sitting there, wear it like a hat. If you're sitting there in the train, this guy sits on the left-hand side, right overhead like that. That's where it is. Disney on Space Mountain, these guys are actually mounted all over the place on the three lift hills. I found a really nice video of, it's not quite a lights on video, but it's got the, uh, infrared camera so you could see it and we'll take a look at that. Thank you. 
Do you see them now right there on the track? You see there's just a whole bunch of these cam segments. Now, Disney, since that drive fin or the brakes, the brake fin down the center, since Disney's brake fin is not going to be consumable by this guy, what they actually did to make it even quieter is they replaced the tooth on both sides with urethane. That's why they look rounded out really far and they look kind of really thick and bulky on the end because it's essentially rubber on the end of those. So as it drags through, there's no noise as it passes through there. And then because there's so many of them, they work really well. As soon as that thing stops, it holds the train. Now, the whole thing for those ones on Space Mountain, the whole thing is that they work off of friction. The only way they work is that if that brake fin has nothing on it, if there's no oil, no grease on it. Now, in general, you want to keep brake fins like very clean because you don't want to put oil and stuff onto the brakes themselves. But when that brake fin is also the anti-rollback, it's even more critical that it stays nice and clean at the same time. So we'll go back to the video real quick. Okay, so really nice video, right? I like it. Thank you very much for letting me use that video. I do appreciate that. Uh, in the description down below, there is a link to that video if you want to watch the rest of it. It's pretty good. But these guys are all over the lift hills on Space Mountain, and then they also use them in a very unique way uh, in the station area, too. Really interesting there. Uh, Space Mountain's the only place I've seen it, but... Unlike a lot of you, I haven't gotten out there and gone over a lot of places out there, so you might see them somewhere else too. But what they actually did is they took this assembly and mounted it flat in the station area, and then they connected two pneumatic rams to this piece right here. So as the brake fin passes through and it stops right there as the train stops in that area, then they say, okay, advance the train, and those two pneumatic rams simply push this whole assembly forward. And then these guys become drive fins. It becomes a driving surface at that time, like a booster. Morning, you So I thought that was really interesting. They got these all over the place in there. Um, I talked with one person who had much knowledge of that park, um, way more. <laughs> he, he worked there for a very long time. Um, he said one of the key things about that whole area for Space Mountain was simply just keeping it clean because you'd have parts and pieces coming off of everything and they'd all wound up down there at the bottom of the ride and the mechanics weren't taking that much care of it. They were, they were doing a good job maintaining it, but no one went out and cleaned the ride. And some people might say, oh, like, what's, what's the difference? What does that matter? Because if I walk an infield of a ride and I find a component down there, well, I'm going to stop and figure out where that component came from. But they weren't doing that. So they would do their inspection of the trains and they would they would do their inspection of the track and, and everything would be signed off and the ride was safe and it was opened up. There's nothing wrong with that. But down in the infield area, there was all sorts of parts and pieces to everything. You know, cam springs and things like that that would break little, like when they lost the urethane pads on some of them, they would just fall down to the ground and they would just leave them there at the time. So... Um, 
the guy who I was talking with says, well, one of the first things he did was simply just, he took, it was a full evening and simply just cleaned the base of the ride <laughs> to get all the parts and pieces out of there. I thought that was interesting. At this point in the video, if you haven't already, please make sure you like and subscribe and give me some comments down there. Let me know if you've got any fun stories to add on to these. And then let me know if you want to see something for topics in the future, too. I'm always up for new stuff. I've got a list of things that I'm making, but sometimes somebody says something and I'm like, oh yeah, let's do that one real quick. That, that really sounds like fun. I do enjoy getting that information. You guys come up with a lot of good ideas for videos, so... Let me know if you got them. You can also email me at ryantheridemechanic at yahoo.com. Let's get back into the video. The way I tell people to inspect roller coasters, again, you've got to look down to look up because if you snap a structure bolt way up 200 feet in the air, you're not going to necessarily see that that structure bolt was broken, especially because I've had them stick halfway in. Like the bottom looks just fine. The top, the head is missing but it's still the shank and the nut is still painted and everything on the bottom side look perfect. But in that area, I found this 30 millimeter head sitting there that was painted the same color as the ride and it was freshly sheared off the back. And it was like, uh oh, I didn't need binoculars. I didn't need anything else to see and find out where that was. I simply knew if it was on the ground I knew it wasn't up there. <laughs> so those are your two main styles. You have your safety ratchet, dog, and your cam style, whether it be the cams on the train or the cams on the track. But those are your main styles right there. And then you have secondaries like the sprag on the lift chain and the brake on the motor. Some rides used both of those things to create the anti-rollback system. One thing that comes to mind is water rides. We had a Intamin shoot to shoots and that ride used, let's see, it had 10 anti rollbacks going up the lift hill and an 11th one on the motor itself. So the shoot to shoot rides use two chains running in parallel with each other with a bunch of Bongozi boards stretched across it. Bongozi boards are super heavy. And basically what they did is they passed the chain through sprockets and each one of the sprockets, they were in sets. So it was five sets going all the way up from the bottom to the top, one, two, three, four, five. And they passed it through those sprockets with a retention plate so the chain couldn't hop up and over the sprocket. And the sprocket had the sprag underneath it. So there was essentially 10 sprags going up the lift hill and then on the motor at the very top on the other side where both the bull wheels were that turned both the chains in unison, that drive assembly had another sprag on the outside of that that made the 11th sprag. But that was the anti-rollback system for the shoot the shoots ride. Man, say that fast. And there was really no way to check that. We put both boats, which were very heavy, on that lift hill and stopped it, nothing happened. But the only real way to check that would be to find some starting and stopping where the chain wasn't quite there and then try to rotate the gear backwards. But the way sprags work, they're so finite, you can't find that. So every once in a while, we would go out there and find one was making noise or one was wearing so we would just replace it at that point in time but most of the time there was no simple check for the any rollbacks on that ride other rides good mention is like a log flume ride log flume rides actually use big paddles going up the side if you've seen them they're probably you see the the log going up there and you hear them going duh, 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 as it passes by they're simply just a dog that hangs off the trough and then it catches the guide wheels as they pass up. So as a guide wheel passes by, it simply just falls in right behind the guide wheel as it passes up. And then you'll notice they turn into these really big paddles on the crown of the lift hill. 
And one of the reasons for that is as the log cordals, like all those wheels move up and down and depending on weight, your wheel could be up high or your wheel could be down low. So when you're flat on the lift, they said dimensionally the wheel is here. So our anti-rollback dog is gonna be here. So it hits in the center. But once it started crowning over the top and started doing this number, the variables became too big. So instead of using a single cam, they used a really wide plate and they put those things and it went across and that's when they you hear those big ones fold back in as you're crowning over the top. So we'll go over this one also real quick. I made this one up as well. I don't know if you could tell. I know it looks like it's directly off of a roller coaster, but it's not. I actually made this out of cardboard as well. Um, but this is essentially an inverted anti-rollback. The tooth rail would be up on top, so the anti-rollback cam would be sticking up there, and your rail would be like this, and as it passes by, same thing. It'll latch in right there and stop the train just where it is. So, as I mentioned earlier, uh, B&M likes to use these pads just to make them quiet as they go up there. I know Intamin for sure, most manufacturers will spring load this so it's in the up position like that. But Intamin likes to make theirs with a really big weight off to this side. So simply just the weight of the material lets it come back up and stick up there like that. So you can have that there and it just it naturally comes back up every time. Then they can just use a very lightweight small spring just to assist that coming up each time to ensure it happens. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, is, is he going to spring load more cardboard? Yeah. Okay, so there we go. I spring loaded this cardboard too. Got a little rubber band right there. So if I push down on that guy, he'll just spring right back up. Um, one of the things that a lot of manufacturers do on inverts and things like that especially is they silence the anti-rollbacks altogether. And this works on inverts, it works on just normal sit-down coasters, it works on a lot of stuff. And the design is actually really simple. There's a couple different ways to do it. Um, but one of the things that I've seen, like the first thing I was like, what is that? Are they doing what I think they're doing? And they were. It was an Intamin model just like this. And right where the anti-rollback was on the side, there is a big wheel that runs right on the outside of it. I tried making an example. I couldn't get it to work though, so, but I tried. Um, the wheel, the wheel sits right on the outside of that guy. And then behind it, there would be a flat plate made out of aluminum or copper. And then on the back side of the wheel, there would be magnets. Like I've, I actually have magnets on here. There we go. Um, there would be magnets on there. And then basically as it sits there and as the wheel rotates, it would basically create eddy currents in that assembly and then pull the anti-rollback like it just did. It would actually pull the anti-rollback down as long as the wheel is turning. And then as soon as the wheel came to a stop or close to a stop, the spring would overcome the eddy currents and then the anti-rollback would simply go back up. Or if it was a very sudden thing with it down in a down position like that, if you were to let's say suddenly break the chain and it suddenly rolled backwards, well the same wheel that's creating those eddy currents to keep the rotational force of this down now works in reverse and creates the eddy currents to actually slap that guy back up to the top like that to where it's now engaged again. So that's one way to do it. You can create an eddy current assembly with a round plate behind there with magnets as it rotates on a wheel. But on a lot of the Intamin rides, that's the reason why you see the any rollback rail typically cut out of looks like an I-beam or a C-channel. And then right next to it, there's a big flat wide spot right there. That's for the wheel to ride on 
So as it's turning, it simply pushes that any roll back down as it's turning the entire time. And as soon as it stops, it comes back up. Or if it decides to roll backwards, it comes back up all of a sudden. That's your general device there. The other one that's used a lot on this is a shoe that sits off to the side. The thing about the shoe is that it's a, also it's an eddy current drive and it works off of a rail next to this. So Intamin used a wheel to make contact to the run surface. Well, the reason for the shoe is as it drives past and as the aluminum fin passes through that magnetic shoe, it creates drag because of the eddy current. So it'll create drag and then it will do the same thing. It will pull that any roll back away from the surface as long as that there's plenty of movement and speed. It'll pull it away from the surface and then as soon as the movement stops or the speed slows down, that guy returns back up again. So that's your basic invert. And the silencing parts, they work for both inverts and non-inverts. So you can really put it on whatever you want to. Let's see, I have to switch back into fabrication mode real quick. There is another style of silencing that Gershlauer's use. I was experienced with those guys. Get ready for a major remodel, fellas. We're back in hardware mode. Okay, the Gershlauer one, this is a really crude example of it, but it was actually effective. This guy, this would basically be their anti-rollback that would come down there and, and the tooth rail would be underneath here where it would fall into and stop on. So what they did is they took this little piece right here, shaped like an L, and there was a fin that ran right alongside of it. In fact, most of the vertical lifts, you can see these fins sticking up on both sides of it. You'll see the, the chain, then the anti-rollback teeth, or the tooth rail, and then you'll see these two fins, one on each side, but that's for these little guys right here. It's used a little cleat off to the side running on a rail next to the, the anti-rollback. So you'll see this on some lifts. You'll see the chain trough. You'll see the anti-rollbacks, the teeth on both sides, the tooth rail on both sides of it. And then you'll see two more things right next to that. Those two things right next to it, which are typically steel in areas where there's high cordling, um, typically at the base where you make the 90 degree curve up, the a lot of times that is plastic on a lot of the Gerschlauer rides. I've even seen some that use brushes for some reason. I don't know. Maybe they didn't want to cut the plastic and put it in there. Maybe they had some sort of alternate idea. But that is to keep the anti-rollbacks up away from the teeth as the train starts to go up. These two fins, one on each side, but that's for these little guys right here. It's really simple it's shaped like an l in fact if you bend this <laughs> shaped like an l just like that but essentially all this did was as it came up to there that this guy would drag on that rail the entire time and it would hold the anti roll back up just like that like where my hand is the rail and the anti-roll back is now just above all the tooth ratchets. That was at a perfect 90 degree angle that was resting on that little elbow right there. And then what happened is that as soon as you stopped the vehicle and tried to go backwards with it because it was balanced right at 90 degrees, as soon as you went to go backwards, it would kick up and allow the any rollback dog to suddenly drop down into place. So again, as it would come down and it was come around at the base of the lift, it would pick up that rail and start to drag on it. And then it would hold the any rollback up. And then when the train stopped going up the lift hill, as soon as that tried to roll backwards, that little bracket would simply just fold back underneath and then the whole thing would drop back down and bite in. Very effective, very easy to maintain. That little L piece that's coming off the side, that guy was kind of consumable 
because it did wear on that rail the entire time and they get little U-grooves worn into them. Have to replace them, but they're very small, very easy. And then the stops and stuff that were in there were simply just machined out of the anti-rollback dog. Very simple. But I noticed, I see on a lot of the vertical lifts, Gerschlauer still uses those uh, for lifts where they do use a tooth and rail application, not the anti-rollback free lifts that some of the vertical lifts use where they have the brake fins sitting off there. Okay, so one of the questions I got is why are they only used on lift hills? So for that, they're talking about older wooden roller coasters. You probably see these on some old wooden roller coasters. As you go up and over the hill, like right at the very top of the hill, a lot of times you'll see anti-rollback teeth sitting there as you go up and over. Those are anti-rollback teeth, yes, but those are not for true anti-rollbacks. What those are is their convenience teeth. So as the train goes up and over them, they do use the anti-rollback dogs on the train. They do ratchet over them as it goes up and over. But they're there for those days when that thing is running really slow and it possibly is going to valley. So as it goes up and over those, they start ratcheting. And then if the train slows down too far, they simply stop right there and the train is held there. It's more convenience than anything else because if that train rolled backwards at that point in time, it can go all the way down to the bottom, of course, that's valleyed. It can valley all the way down at the bottom and then you have to end up pulling that train up and over those hills. So they kind of said, well, why don't we just stop it at the top if we can? So they did that. One of the downsides to that is that those teeth that are on the track wear down super fast because they just get hammered by the anti-rollbacks as they cross over those at a high rate of speed for the days when the ride is running fast and you have no issues with it. So they just hammer those things as it passes by there. So those teeth get worn down super fast. And then at the same time, your anti-rollbacks on the train, the dogs themselves, really take a beating. They start getting mushroomed out and then you have to grind them back in the profile and you can only do that a couple of times before the entire dog needs to be replaced. And if they're going over those things fast and they're slapping and they're banging underneath the train, that means you're starting to wear down your pivots and things like that too, where the whole, lots of times are weldments, which just means they're multiple components welded together. But your weldment that holds that whole assembly probably is going to have to be replaced too. So it's much easier on all the equipment if you don't put those convenience anti-rollbacks in the track. But the downside is, is that if it does valley, it's quite a mess to recover. But that's uh, you won't see that a lot on newer roller coasters made out of wood simply because they, they run the things much faster these days. Uh, a lot of the GCIs, I know the GCI I used to work on had them as well. Um, not the anti-rollbacks themselves, but they had the wood sitting there. They had It's like a two-layered stack piece of wood that sits there. And it was in those areas for if the park wanted to add the anti-rollback rails to those pieces of wood. They had something that they can actually latch on to. But our park never put those on. And I see GCI put those on a handful of their models just as a convenience thing. But I see other parks didn't put those on as well too. Some did, but a lot opted not to. The easiest way on pretty much all roller coasters to check the anti-rollbacks to make sure they're working is in the work bay, you do a physical check and make sure they're simply free moving, move nice and easily. And then on the track, you simply just stop it on the lift. And there should be no movement from anything uh, unless you have a, a B&M where they require that sprag check, which is much more difficult to hit. But most all rides, you pretty much stop it and the thing lands pretty hard and you could tell that the anti-rollbacks bit in just fine. Some mechanics might opt to take that moment to lock the ride out and go out and verify that all the anti-rollbacks did in fact fall into place. Um, kind of overkill, honestly, in my opinion. If, if you've tested the dog and the cam assembly in the station and you know that they move freely and work freely, then 
them all biting in on the rail is just a set of circumstances that line up because it's like, yeah, you're eventually going to have one that is just missed the tooth in the right spot due to where the train was, how it rolled back, all that other stuff. And then are you going to sideline the train trying to figure out why it just landed funny? Probably not. It's, it's working fine. It did its job. When you get up into bigger rides like the dive coasters out there like B&M makes, those got some big anti-rollbacks underneath those things. Uh, probably because the train is so wide, they need one on each side, which makes sense if you think about it because the train is really wide. It's got a lot of weight off to both sides. When you stop the train and let it roll backwards and let it catch, if you catch one side, even though you're you're only you're only talking about 300 millimeters between the two dogs. But if you stop and only catch it on one dog, that means it puts all your weight cantilevered against the wheel carriers in a triangle like that. So you've got the any roll back dog holding there, and then the whole thing is twisting against the wheel carriers and that one dog, as opposed to if you put two dogs on there, and let them both catch at the same exact time, then the weight is sitting evenly. There's hardly any pressure on the wheel carriers. Much better assembly. The last thing I could think of, have you ever been riding on a train where it sounds like the anti-rollbacks are not uniform? They're kind of making an odd sound as they go up. It's not an even click, 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 click. It's just, they're kind of like dancing. Typically what that is, is that is multiple anti-rollbacks that are nice and loose. They're simply just hitting at different frequencies. Some may ba fall back down fast, some may fall back down a little slow. And between all the anti-rollbacks in the train all the way up there, the speed and the harmonics of everything working, they kind of make that funky sound. So you might not get an even ratcheting sound as you go up the lift hill. You might get more of a a funky drum tune <laughs> or a little bit of a song going up the lift hill but it doesn't matter it's still telling you it's working that's one of the only things that you can broadcast across the park to say it's working properly well there you go i know there was a lot of questions that came off the lift videos and i appreciate everyone who i've said like i'm gonna i'm gonna answer the questions in the any rollback video because i i have that coming so I, I appreciate everyone for that. Um, if you haven't already, make sure you like and subscribe. Leave some comments down below. Let me know if there's future topics you want to see. I know some of my topics are very broad and some of them are laser beam focused. So I, I do what I can with the knowledge I have. Sometimes people ask me to ask, say, hey, can you make a video about this? And Sometimes I honestly just can't. I don't have a knowledge, enough knowledge about a finite subject that someone might be asking about to legitimately say, yeah, this is how it is. Uh, sometimes I have plenty of knowledge. It all depends on what the subject is. Let me know. Also, if you want to contact me, you can go ahead and contact me at the email, uh, which is ryantherideMechanic at yahoo.com, or you can simply just comment down below if you have a question about something that's a little more off-key that you want to talk about, use the email. That's fine. I typically con contact people back within a couple days on that. So I think that's going to do it for this video. Thanks so much for watching. I'm Ryan the Ride Mechanic, and as always, stay off the air gates. Bye.